Welcome everybody to the Indiana Basketball Weekly Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I am your host for the Indiana Basketball Weekly Show, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I would like to welcome to the show best-selling author, Kent Sterling. Uh, How you doing, Kent? I am doing great. I am enjoying myself being a best-selling author and uh, enjoying really the eve of what I think is the best college basketball day in Indianapolis throughout the season, as long as there's not a Final Four here. I uh, absolutely love the Crossroads Classic that's going to be played tomorrow at Bankers Life Fieldhouse. Yeah, and we've got Indiana and Notre Dame. And yep. this is a game that, I don't know, I don't know how to take it because Notre Dame early in the year looked a little rough. They've had a rocky start. They suffered blowout losses to North Carolina, Maryland, lost to BC, Boston College by a point. They're still a respectable 8-3. and three. They're coming off a big win against UCLA last week. They're led by two seniors in T.J. Gibbs and John Mooney. And they've got two sophomore guards in Dane Goodwin and Prentice Hub. What's your take on Notre Dame coming into this game? You know, you mentioned Mooney, and they got the big kid underneath, the 6'11 kid, who you've got to account for as you attack the bucket. Um, Fluger. Uh, you know, is a guy that we've seen for a long time. They're, they're really pretty experienced. They're not terribly good, but they got a lot of seniors and they got a lot of sophomores. It, but I think that the scheduling has really worked out for Indiana. Last year, they had Butler. I think that was a good year to have Butler. This year, I think it's a good year to have Notre Dame instead of Butler. If they played Butler, I don't think that this would be as much fun to watch as it's going to be tomorrow, as I think they're going to be able to beat Notre Dame. But as we've learned, you really can't count on Indiana with any degree of, of confidence, the level of play they're going to bring uh, in any of these games. So, you know what, if they show up and show out, they're going to win. And if they decide, you know, we, we really don't need to work as hard as maybe we should, then they're going to get beat. So does it make you feel any better after Nebraska win that Nebraska goes a couple days later and pounds Purdue? Not really. Uh, that game, you know, that was at, at their place. And until the other night when, it, what was it, last night, night before, when Michigan State beat Northwestern up in Evanston, a, uh, a road game had not won, or a road team had not won in the Big Ten. I, I, and it, it's not really, the whole Nebraska thing, to me, wasn't about Nebraska, whether they were any good or whether they weren't. It was what was Indiana. Not from a comparative standpoint to Nebraska, but what were they like as they executed? How many mental mistakes did they make? How many defensive errors did they make that are easily corrected? And how many are, you know, mistakes that we are we have become way too used to Indiana uh, com committing? And I really think that Indiana just played poorly and still managed to win. And they're going to have to – I mean, we know how this works. In November and December, you can get away – with mistakes as long as you continue to improve. And then in January and February, you're going to be okay because you got better. And it's better to win when or learn when winning than learn while losing, certainly. But Indiana, man, they just look like a team that has not figured it out. Maybe they don't even know to this point what they need to do better and what they need to improve at. And I'm not talking about the coaches, but the players and how they need, you know, a lot of times if you – if you play poorly and win, you can get tricked into not believing that you played poorly. And I think that maybe that's where Indiana is. Yeah, and the thing that worries me about Indiana is the ability to defend their perimeter. And Notre Dame is a team that they're not shy about taking threes. And Indiana struggled to defend the three-point line. Yep. Nebraska shot 38% from deep and the Hoosiers' overtime victory. And Notre Dame's going to test them. The Irish are 13th in the country in three-point attempts this season, averaging almost 30 attempts per game. They shoot 34% from deep. Four players shoot over 31%, including Goodwin, who shoots 42% from the outside. T.J. Gibbs, who's around 40. Prentice Hub, who's almost 40. And the Indiana guards are going to be tested on their perimeter defense in this game. You know, if you're going to help, you got to recover. and recover defense and Indiana has not been good at recovering and they need to get good real quick or like we said this is not going to be a fun game for anybody to watch or to play in and and we'll see with Indiana 
whether they can I, – I mean, I've never seen a team so consistent in their inability to do fundamentally kind of simple things at a high level. I mean, they, we talk about it every week, but they always find the oddest way to try to enter the post. And, and their level of defense uh, as they – and with pack line, you've got to be able to if, – if you're going to cry, try to close with two guys – then you've got to be able to recover to your man with dispatch. And Indiana just hadn't done it, and they don't seem to know that they need to do it, and that's a problem. Yeah, the other problem, I think, is the matchup down low with John Mooney, who's a guy that Indiana has shown that they have trouble against a versatile number five. Um, We saw that in Wisconsin. And he up there was a Nate Reavers who gave Bronx fits to the point where he didn't even play much in the second half. And then, of course, a cook, a cook was a shot blocking machine <laughs> at Madison Square Garden. And Bronx important to his team's success. But when you look at Mooney, he averages 14.8 points per game, 13.4 rebounds a game. And I, this is a matchup that really worries me because I don't think Brunk can handle him. Do you think they just put Trace Jackson on him? Well, they better because all they got after that's uh, Devon or Duran, and I don't think Duran's the right answer. So you, you've got to hope that Trace is going to be able to do it. He's he's kind of met expectations to this point at the very least in every regard as a player. So maybe that is something that he's going to be able to do. And, and then you get that 6'11 kid down low, and, and you wonder with Joey down low whether he's going to be able to score, whether he's going to be able to defend. I think the matchups down low, not the guard matchups, but the matchups at the 4 and 5 might be a challenge for Indiana. Yeah, and another challenge. Is Devontae Green going to play? Have you heard the latest? I've heard that he is getting better and that they expect him to play tomorrow. But I, I think I don't think it's going to be a game time decision. I, I think that they're fairly confident that he's going to play is what I've heard. And uh, so, I mean, that can mean two different things, can't it? Yeah. And only one of those things is real good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if Devonte Green is limited, which we'd assume he, he probably will be at least limited a little bit, um, Rob Fennessy should be a little bit more mm-hmm. healthy. But I think this means that. This is a game where a big effort from Armand Franklin would be huge towards winning this game. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, and he is due to make some shots, right? We got to get him making shots. And if he makes shots, then he becomes a guy who who might not be a a 15-minute-a-game guy. He might be a 30-minute-a-game guy because he can defend. He's a smart guy. He gets on the floor. He's scrappy. And Indiana, for all its... For all its traits, good and bad, scrappy has not been something that you would – that's not a word you'd use to describe these guys. Uh, and if Armand can start hitting shots, they become a different team. And and that would be excellent. Uh, you've got guys – if Finnessy continues to get healthier and if he can shoot it a little bit, we saw how important he was last year in the Crossroads Classic, hitting that crazy three as they were trying to isolate Romeo but couldn't, and he knocks down the bucket – you know, and, and that's what this thing always is. You know, it's always kind of a neighborhood scrap where it comes down to the last minute and who can hit the shot. Yeah, and I think T.J. Gibbs is going to play a big part in this too because he's a veteran, and I think that's why it's so important that they need minutes from Devontae Green because I think Armand Franklin going against an experienced Gibbs could cause IU some big issues also. Yeah, this, this you look at this game, and, and it really does come down to matchups, as almost all college basketball games do. But this game, either the matchups are going to favor Indiana or they're going to favor Notre Dame. I don't think that it's going to be where, you know, you, you have any kind of equanimity, which is in direct opposition to the other game with Butler and, and Purdue, where those teams – they're not mirror images of each other, but they're really, really close, especially if Matt Harms can't play. But Notre Dame, Indiana, very, very similar in the way they do a lot of things. Yeah, and I, I think this game could be decided by the bench, which would play in the IU's favor, I would think. I think I use it deeper because Notre Dame, historically even, has played a tight rotation. They don't go more than seven or eight deep. Um, they've lost yep. Robbie Carmody 
which I think hurts them also there. And I, it could come down to Demise Anderson, Jerome Hunter, Race Thompson, maybe even Deron Davis. If those guys can all have solid minutes, that could go a big way or a long way in deciding this game also. You know, and that's a, that's a great point about Notre Dame. Mike Bray always plays a skinny bench. You know, it's usually seven that he goes to, and they get almost all of the minutes. This year isn't any different in that regard. Indiana's been going 11 deep. And so if you can get really good defense out of Demise Anderson and he can hit some shots, then automatic, like you're one up. And if this thing comes down to late game stuff, you know, maybe it's because Indiana does spread out its uh, its minutes that they're going to they're gonna have fresher legs and they're going to be able to play better down the stretch. But you know what? I it, This is something that I've tried to do because I noticed this was a couple of years ago, Notre Dame was averaging more than 20 minutes a game from their starters more than their opponents and more than anybody else in the top 30 in college basketball. 20 minutes, that's that's four minutes a guy among the starters. But I'll tell you, you watch Notre Dame play, you can't tell that these guys are playing extra minutes. So I don't know, I, that may be just a canard, that may be fantasy that playing 11 guys instead of seven gives a team with 11 an advantage because they're fresher. How about this, uh, Kent? That's going to be interesting if the to watch. Team, if the team with seven stays out of foul trouble, I think the yeah. team with seven probably has a bigger advantage because you're playing just your best players. And and that's kind of what I don't get about Indiana. I don't understand how going to 11 man on all the scholarship kids are in the rotation. And I don't understand how that's an advantage for Archie Miller and, and and IU, I I just don't see and and you know you can see it that there there's a lack of of symmetry, and and there's a lack of kind of awareness where the other four guys on the floor are because I think that I, I mean how can you get a rhythm with the other four guys when the other four guys are constantly changing I mean it's like a it's like square dancing for God's sake Indiana you've got a different partner here partner here and you got a do si do with that guy. And then you're promenading right with this person. And, you know, it's different with every single person. And over the course of a 40-minute game, if you're playing 11 guys all like, you know, between 14 and 26 minutes, I don't know how you develop any kind of continuity in your offense or your defense. Well, how about this? We see all kind of teams that, as you get deeper and deeper into the season, we'll pair that down to where they're not going any more than eight deep. And... I think this, when you look at IU and you go to Race Thompson and you go to Jerome Hunter, that is a significant drop-off from what you had in the game. So if the drop-off's not that big, I can see where it would help. But the drop-off to me is fairly large from the starters to the second string guys. Well, and they all have different strengths, right? Like Race Thompson is not a scorer, but he's not a bad banger. He can create space underneath. You know, he can block out. He can do all that stuff but he's not going to score the basketball a bunch. Jerome Hunter is still trying to kind of figure out who he is and what he does with his kind of, you know, with the new normal for him physically. And and so he's not exactly the same player that anybody expected when he was recruited. And and so that makes it, I, I think, doubly tough. You know, and if, if you've got Finnessy, who's kind of hurt, you got Devontae, who's kind of hurt, who, who can you count on to do anything at any given time out there? It becomes very confusing, I think. Maybe not for Archie as much as it is for the other players. Yeah, because I, I see everybody talk about the depth of this IU team. But really, I think this IU team is better if they're playing with their best eight players. Well, you would think, right? Logic would dictate unless everybody is exactly you know, similar in their talent. But that can't be the case. Uh, I think you... I, I don't know. You know, I get it in November and December. Uh, I understand if, if you want to give everybody a shot. Yeah, plus you're trying to pair it to those eight guys. Right, right. And you don't want anybody to become a problem. You don't want these guys to start bitching and moaning about minutes and about the rotation and start to mope during practice. You don't want 18-year-olds to become 18-year-olds, right? You want them to see hope at the end of the tunnel. And, and hopefully these guys these guys do, because I think from a qualitative standpoint, you're not getting out of this roster what maybe you would if you did pare it down. All right, so we're not going to pick the game because 
why would we want to humiliate ourselves on air <laughs> uh, like we did about a week ago? But I think this is going to be a close game, and I think it's going to be decided by Trace Jackson Davis underneath with John Mooney. You know, I hope it's de- if it's decided by Trace, then I think Indiana wins. I, I think if he's successful underneath and he he becomes a guy that Indiana can count on and Indiana goes to early and often and makes Notre Dame kind of adjust to what he can do and they pull guys in so that the guards can kind of get done what they want to get done without pressure, I think that that'll be a good day for the Hoosiers. If Notre Dame hits a bunch of threes, then I think it's a long day for the Hoosiers. Yeah, I think it's a really long day for the Hoosiers then. Yep. Um, All right, Notre Dame, Indiana. Give me a couple memories of memorable Notre Dame, Indiana games. Ooh, hey, you know what? It, it goes back to a game that I didn't see, but I think they won one game. What was it, like 89 to 23? Oh, that was you know, the like 94 to 29 and 71. It was actually the first yeah, game it. in Assembly Hall history. And the interesting thing about that game was the year before in like 1970, Indiana beat Notre Dame like 106 to 103. <laughs> and that was what was the coach's name it was Lou Lou Watson Lou Watson yeah and he's yeah. hurrying Hoosiers because they came back and beat like the number <laughs> six rank Indiana team or lost to Indiana and then the next year Indiana just throttled them and that was the first year for Digger Phelps I think it was the first year for Bob Knight the first time they yeah. played each other and actually, I think John Ritter scored 31 in that game. So he scored more than the entire Notre Dame team did. <laughs> that, uh, to me, this series, because of our generation, it's, dis- it's, it's really defined by those two coaches. It's Knight and Phelps. And me feeling very, very superior every time we played Notre Dame because I thought that, and I still think, that Bobby Knight, could run circles around Digger Phelps from a basketball a basketball acumen but in standpoint. In Digger's defense, Bobby Knight could run circles about almost everybody. Yeah, but I hate defending Digger Phelps, so so I won't. <laughs> I'll just blame Di- blame Digger for being a knucklehead. All right, who's better, Digger Phelps or Tom Crean? Ooh, oh, wow, wow! You know, I'm going to give Crean an advantage because of Digger with the obnoxious highlighter and tie combinations on ESPN. That was just so annoying to me that I or the the handkerchief. I, I didn't like all the accessorizing with a highlighter. I never knew what he was doing holding a highlighter. That was annoying to me, even more annoying than anything that Tom Crean did as we watched him for nine years. Okay, we'll go with That's that. That's the nicest thing I've ever said about Tom Crean, by the way. Yeah, but I actually, I mean, I don't think Dickerfels was a terrible coach. I just don't think he was a very good X and O's coach. He could recruit he was some a guys. Really good recruiter. He he got a lot of really talented guys. A couple of guys out of Indiana, out of Cathedral High School, Scott Hicks and Kenny Barlow, who are absolute workhorses back in the mid '80s. Yeah, and you had seventy eighty went to the Final Four and lost to who did they lose to? They lose to Arkansas, I think it was. Yeah, right. Or right. No, it wasn't Arkansas? Couldn't have been. Kentucky what beat it? Arkansas. Duke. In 78? Duke beat Notre Dame. Okay. Yeah, Duke beat Notre Dame in 78 because that was right. the Kelly, Trapuca, Bill right. and Beard team. Right. But, right. And Bill they had a Beard. lot of talent. He had Adrian uh, Dantley, what, in 70, the mid-70s. Austin yep. Carr played at Notre Dame. And David course, Rivers was David terrific. Rivers. Yeah, David Rivers yep. in the mid to late 80s. He was a stud. Yep, and, and he did. He was a good recruiter and, and not a very good tactician and an annoying guy. Uh, here's a here's a Digger felt story. I it, I used to work with Eddie White up here in Indianapolis, and people at Indy know Eddie. Hosted a radio show, and now he works for the Pacers. And and Eddie used to be uh, a part of the SID uh, cotillion up at Notre Dame. And I said, Eddie, all right, you know I don't like Digger Phelps. Tell me a story that's going to make me like Digger Phelps. And he said, Okay, I got the story. So uh, he said, I'm playing with Digger up in South Bend at a, uh, an outing, a charitable outing. We're, we're playing a, uh, a, a scramble, and Digger is holding up play by going into the woods. He's going into the woods. Every shot he hits, he, he gets his ball, and then he goes into the woods. And this happens for like six holes. And finally, I say to Digger, I say, what the hell are you doing in the woods, Digger? And he said, Eddie, I got to tell you, 
uh, what I'm doing is I'm looking for golf balls. I'm looking for golf balls because I go out to that, that celebrity thing out in Lake Tahoe. I sign the golf balls and I give them to the kids and the kids just absolutely love it. And, and so that's Eddie's story to make me like Digger Phelps. What Digger was doing, instead of going to the Walmart and spending 50 bucks on a bunch of old pinnacles that, that he could have signed, he's holding a play during a, a, a scramble where these guys are getting around the course in six hours because Digger is insisting upon looking at balls, like I said, rather than going to the Walmart and spending a few bucks on new ones that he could sign for the kids. And so I liked him even less. Well, in Digger's defense, though, they probably spent all the money on Persegian, Divine, Faust, and Holtz while he was there. So <laughs> he may have only been making like twelve seventy-five an hour or something. <laughs> yeah, that could be. I but, just I hate slow golf, and I hate I hate cheap bastards. And Digger caused slow golf by being a cheap bastard, <laughs> so I hate him twice. So once again, Tom Crean or Digger Phelps, which one do you hate the most? I don't believe Tom Crean plays golf. So I'm going to have to side uh, with Crean again because if you don't play, you can't hold up play. All right. Good enough. All right. Real <laughs> quick, I wanted to bring this up because um, I had a buddy, Bobby Sheridan from the Sheridan Report, who's been on our shows before, who brought this up the other day, said he hadn't seen this before. But if you look at the Big Ten standings, Michigan State's at 2-0, and Northwestern's yeah. 0-2. Every other team is 1-1. and isn't that something? How is that possible? That is, and yeah. I, I think now what we see is, I, I don't know that the Big Ten is as strong as we might have thought it was a week or two ago, but I think it's a lot deeper than what we thought it was at the start of the year. I think it's stronger at the bottom and weaker at the top. Yeah. You know, I don't think that there's any kind of elite level play in the Big Ten to this point. Maybe it'll come. You know, maybe Michigan State's going to develop. Maybe Michigan will develop. Maybe Ohio State, they got beat, but you know what? They have looked really, really good. That win against Villanova, they looked awesome. And so maybe that that capability that we saw in November translates to dominance in January and February. But I would agree. I mean, you try to pick this conference from any – who do you pick for, for last? Who do you pick as the doormat? I, I would have no idea who's going to finish last. No, because the teams that have surprised me so far are Illinois and Rutgers, because Rutgers yeah. beat up a really good Seton Hall team who beat Maryland the other night. Well, I'll tell you what, there's coaching in the Big Ten like there like doesn't exist in any other conference. Steve Peichel can flat coach. Brad Underwood can flat coach. These guys are terrific coaches. Fred Hoiberg is a really, really good coach. Not great in the NBA, but he didn't have a whole lot to work with with the Bulls. They're not very talented. Well, they have coach in the talented. NBA is a lot different than coach in college. But you better, like, you better have your tactical X and O's or your X's and O's. You, you better have those down. And I think that that's what we saw with Hoiberg out at Nebraska against Purdue. We said, and against Indiana. I thought he out schemed Indiana. They couldn't outplay Indiana. They couldn't outscore Indiana. In the end. But I thought we got out schemed. And so you got you got coaches in in the Big Ten from top to bottom who are really, really, really good. You know what though? I, I think the Illinois and the Rutgers and all these teams in the middle, I think the coaching may be better than what the coaching is at the top. Because I don't think Maryland's yeah, that's a good overly point. impressive at being coached. I don't think Michigan right. is. Michigan State, of course, they got Izzo, you can't really you can't argue with Tom Izzo. But outside of that, I mean, I think it's possible that the mid-tier programs could end up moving up more and more as this year or the next couple of years go just because of that coaching. Yeah, we don't know what Juwan Howard is yet as a coach. But I, I think that we can, to your point, we can kind of uh, infer – what Brad Underwood is because of what he did before he got to Illinois. Yeah. And now what he's doing at Illinois, I, I think they've got a chance to be pretty good. And Pykel, I know, is a really good coach. I think Pat Chambers is a terrific coach. I, I'm so happy. Not for Indiana, I'm unhappy. But for a, a guy like Chambers, who could have easily been fired a couple of years ago, they didn't fire him. They stuck with him. And I think that the guy – is going to have a, uh, a he ain't going to ha- he ain't going to be 12th 
this year in the Big Ten, you know? Hmm. Is that an oops? Because I don't think that was a really properly put together sentence because you threw eight in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that is just basically a shameless way to plug your book, by the way. If you want to plug away now, you ought to. You know what? I've made a lot of mistakes, as you're well aware, Mike, and I continue to make mistakes. And this book chronicles 37 of them. 37 chapters, all mistakes that I've made or adventures that I've had and what I've learned from them. It's called Oops, The Art of Learning from Mistakes and Adventures. It's available on Amazon.com as a book. You can get it as an ebook for your Kindle or whatever. You can get it as an audio book. I sat in the studio, recorded this book, read it orally, six hours and 40 minutes of me telling stories that make me look, frankly, ridiculous. Damn, and there's 37 of those? Yeah. Yeah, and I could write Jeez, a second Ken. book. Julie, my wife says, you know what? I can't believe you didn't put this story. I get that every day from her. You know, oh, here's another story. If this book, if it sells a lot, you can do a second one easily. Here are six great stories that you can tell about yourself. Like, I got nothing better to do with my time than extol my lack of virtue and my stupidity. So 37 times, and you're finding more. Maybe you should have named the book, oh, yeah. like, Not Again. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what it is. You know, I mean, you know, you see things, and, and you've coached, and so you know that life's all about mistakes and what you learn from them and how you deal with adversity. So here's a book that it kind of, you know, without shame presents some mistakes that I've made and some adventures I've had and what people can learn from them. And so if you go onto Amazon and you, you search Oops and Kent or Oops and Sterling, there you go. There it'll be. There you go. And five days from now is Christmas. It would be the perfect stocking stuffer. It is. And you don't even need to get it shipped if you order the audio book or you order the e-book. It's delivered electronically. Miracle of miracles. I know. That's something. And you know, I remember when... <laughs> I live in, like, Aurora, in Indiana, and I moved in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and there's nowhere. And it used to be, like, exciting when we'd, like, go to the mall 30 minutes away in Ohio because they would have, like, a Barnes & Noble bookstore, and you'd actually get to look at books. Isn't that nice? It, yeah. It's so quaint. The concept is so quaint, right? Yeah. And yeah, the those... thing was, a lot of times you couldn't find what you wanted, and there was no way to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and now there it is yeah it's so. amazing the technology now and i mean it just blows me away that it used to be a huge deal to go to a bookstore and to, and you know it, i love going to the mall still and i love going to the bookstore and just kind of browsing and seeing what catches my eye but in this case do it online and uh know that if you're the kind of person who enjoys laughing at the expense of others this is right up your alley the mall. I'll tell you, I think the last time I went to the mall, I went to the Tri-County Mall, which used to be the big one around in southwestern Ohio, and they used to have 320 stores. Now it's down to 45, and half of the Is mall right? was like a ghost town, and there was nobody there. You know, there's really one mostly functional mall in Indianapolis. It's called the Fashion Mall up at Keystone at the Crossing, Yeah, and it's still mostly full. And, and still kind of a vibrant place, kind of a high-end place. But, uh, you know, you can go there. You can go see a good movie. they got kind of an art cinema there, and they got the Apple Store. So I'll walk around there and, and just see what's what. I, I'm one of those people. I need to touch something if I'm going to buy it, like clothing. Yeah, especially clothing. I need clothing. to try something on. So, yeah. you know, that's for me. And uh, buying clothes online, I just think is – it's not any fun. Yeah, I don't enjoy You sound it, like my so. wife, Kent. I've always told her. <laughs> She's like, Black Friday, Black Friday, let's go to the stores. I've said, hell, you get the same <laughs> deal, maybe even better, if you just get online. And she's like, well, I don't want to. I want to go shop because that's what yeah, it's fun. That is fun. It is. You walk around with bags and you put them in the car and then you wrap them and stuff. My wife's exactly the opposite. She likes ordering stuff every day when we got a box by the door. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Oh, yeah, I bought pants for my sister. I'm like what? what? What are you talking about? How do you know what size she wears? So, and how do you know they're gonna fit? So anyway, well, especially shoes. Julie. I've never bought shoes like that. Right, right, but right. I, All right. Try, Go ahead. No, no. I was gonna say you try stuff on. I got to be tactile with these things. Yeah, 
I, I agree for the most part. So clothing, I usually don't, unless it's like a hoodie, and then I know that it's going right. to be in the general vicinity. But right. I want to tell everybody, go out, buy Oops, and you can find it on Amazon by Ken Sterling. Check out Ken Sterling at kensterling.com. You can also find him on the Indiana Basketball Weekly Show with me about 15 minutes after the game tomorrow, correct? That's perfect. I'm, uh, I can't wait. We'll talk about a Hoosier victory. Hopefully we will. And All right, brother. we're going to go ahead. We're going to wrap it up. I would remind everybody, you can hear us anywhere you find podcasts, including Xeno Radio, YouTube, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify. So for now, for Ken Sterling, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>